Hello and good evening, everyone. Welcome to our 56 Bluehead's virtual seminar. Bluehead's virtual seminar is a platform that allows healthcare professionals to discuss current management updates of different health related topics for better patient care. And this platform is brought to you by Blue Health Ethiopia, a medical consultancy company founded by medical doctors and a computer engineer. And we aim to be an influential healthcare leader in creating a skilled community through easily accessible knowledge in preventive medicine. And I'm your host, Dr. Enot Adela, a general physician and first aid trainer from Blue Health Ethiopia. Today, it's a pleasure to have Dr. Jonathan Gaetana here with us to give us a presentation on the approach and management to anaphylaxis. Dr. Jonathan Getana is an assistant professor of emergency medicine and critical care at Yakatita Strawlet. Okay, thank you, Dr. Eheno, for the warm introduction. Uh, so today's session is going to be on the approach to and management of uh, anaphylaxis. So, so this is the outline of the presentation. Uh, uh, if you'll have an introduction, we'll discuss briefly the pathophysiology, common triggers, clinical features, the different differentials, as well as diagnostic testing and management. And we will uh, summarize it with uh, how we will decide the disposition of these patients. So uh, anaphylaxis and uh, allergic diseases are having a higher uh, prevalence uh, recently over the past several decades. Uh, this is particularly more in the developed societies. Uh, it's currently estimated that around 30% of the worldwide population will suffer from some component of allergy, 5 to 8% of which is uh, due to uh, food allergies. So it's largely attributed to the change in lifestyle that we are experiencing with uh, globalization and the improvement on the standards of living, as well as our dietary patterns, our uh, use of antibiotics, and the trend of moving towards having smaller families and uh, as well as the hygiene hypothesis where we are being exposed less and less to uh, uh, different microbials, uh, micro, uh, microbials uh, due to different microbes due to the improvement in our uh, sanitation. So the immune system is generally divided into the cellular and humoral components. And this immune system generally works together in a coordinated and complex fashion so that it can protect the host from any potentially harmful offender. So the immune system, however, uh, sometimes can overreact uh, and uh, it might mount a response to a harmless agent producing inappropriate response, which might uh, inadvertently hurt the host, giving rise to allergies or the different uh, allergic diseases. So uh, for most allergic diseases to occur, uh, there should be a patient who is predisposed, uh, which requires exposure to certain allergens through a process which is known as sensitization. Uh, then those substances which usually elicit these allergic reactions are referred to as allergens, and those which elicit the antibody response are termed as antigens. So the hypersensitivity reactions are manifested in clinical symptoms ranging from uh, a mild nuisance to a level which is uh, even fatal to the patient. Uh, and on the allergic continuum, there are several important uh, allergic syndromes. The first of which is uh, urticaria. Uh, urticaria is also referred to as wilts or hives, and it's a common allergic reaction which usually occurs to uh, foods, drugs, different temperature changes, as well as physical stimuli. And uh, it can be characterized by uh, centrally swollen, uh, raised uh, lesion over the skin, which can have varying size with surrounding erythema with uh, a sensation of itching as well as uh, burning. So on this image, you can see the typical uh, uh, skin manifestation of uh, hives or urticaria. Uh, though these skin uh, lesions typically will return to their baseline appearance within usually 30 minutes to uh, 24 uh, hours. So the second syndrome is usually angioedema. So angioedema is characterized by a, a production of a certain swelling of the subcutaneous or uh, mucous membrane, which tends to be more painful than pruritic. Uh, and it's more slower to resolve when we compare it to urticaria. Uh, and whenever there's mucosal involvement, especially the tongue and the larynx, it can result in uh, uh, near, co near complete uh, to complete airway uh, compromise, which, uh, put the, which could put the patient at risk for death. 
So generally, angioedema will usually occur through, uh, I think, one of two of uh, different mechanisms. It's either allergic, which is uh, also called histaminergic angioedema, which usually occurs in response to exposure to foods, drugs, or other physical stimuli, or it could be non-allergic or non-histaminergic, uh, which can be again classified into usually hereditary angioedema or medication-induced angioedema. So the medication-induced angioedema, as we all know, uh, commonly it's the, in those patients who, uh, uh, who are taking ACE inhibitors uh, due to the decreased uh, clearance of kinins and bradykinins, which uh, will contribute to the uh, immune response. <clears throat> so the third and uh, our today's topic will be on the uh, more severe form of this uh, uh, allergic uh, syndrome, which is anaphylaxis. So anaphylaxis is a life-threatening uh, systemic reaction, which is characterized by acute onset of uh, uh, multi-organ involvement. It's usually type 1 hypers hypersensitivity reaction, uh, which is mediated through immunoglobulin E. Uh, it's usually precipitated by precip Dictated by exposure to different allergens in a previously sensitized uh, individual. Uh, so uh, for anaphylaxis, it, uh, there's also a previous term which is also used, uh, anaphylactoid reactions, which is uh, used to denote the non-immunologic or the non-IgE dependent uh, portion of this uh, reaction. However, their uh, endpoint and the predominant uh, manifestations are similar. And there is no significant difference in the management of both the non-immunologic or the immunologic form of anaphylaxis. So the World Allergy Organization has uh, now uh, recommended that we don't use the term anaphylactic reactions since uh, they are almost having the same type of uh, uh, presentation. So coming briefly to the pathophysiology, uh, so our immunologic response to different antigens can be coordinated by two systems. It could be either the innate immune system or the adaptive immune system. So when a host encounters any foreign antigen, the cellular components of the adaptive immune system will interact with the different protein components as well as cellular components of the innate immune system so that they can mount a coordinated defense uh, to neutralize the antigen. So uh, in this figure, I think you can see uh, the, the components of each uh, immune system. So they both arise initially from the pluripotent stem cells, and then they differentiate into the lymphoid precursors, which will lead to formation of T cells and B cells, as well as the colony uh, forming uh, units of granulocyte, erythrocyte, or myeloid and megakaryocytes. Uh, so uh, as part of the... The uh, innate immune system, the mast cells, basophils, and their mediators are the central effectors in the allergy and anaphylaxis. So if there's exposure of a genetically predisposed ind individual to this allergen, it will lead to synthesis and release of those specific uh, allergen, uh, specific uh, immunoglobulins uh, by the plasma cells into the circulation. And this will lead to the fixation of the allergen-specific IgE to the surface receptors on the uh, mast cells, which will complete the process, which is uh, which I mentioned earlier, called sensitization. So these IgE-bearing mast cells are also capable of uh, becoming activated on re-exposure to the specific uh, antigens. And when there is cross-linking of the mast cell receptors by a multivalent uh, allergen, it can set off a cascade of conformational and biochemical events, which will lead to mast cell basophil uh, degranulation uh, and elaboration of cytokines and chemokines, as well as activation of other cellular components. So uh, uh, the degranulation of these preformed uh, mediators will subsequently generate, as I've mentioned, directonic acid metabolites, cytokines, chemokines, and other uh, components. And this is a type 1 mediated reaction, which is immediate hypersensitivity reaction. So IgE mediated. Uh, reactions account for most allergic and anaphylactic reactions, and the exposure to these sensitizing allergens will cause mediators from mast cells and basophils to be released through both the IgE-dependent as well as the independent uh, uh, mast cell de degranulation mechanisms. Okay, so coming into detail about the anaphylaxis now. Uh, so uh, anaphylaxis is estimated to occur in roughly around 2% of the worldwide population. Uh, with a higher uh, predisposition to people living in the U.S., it was as high as 5%. Uh, in general, uh, pregnant women, infants, teenagers, or elderly uh, patients are usually have a higher incidence as compared to the other portions of the society. Uh, 
but the reported mortality in anaphylaxis is generally less than 1%. And there's uh, no particular research done on its prevalence in Ethiopia. But uh, there is certain study on allergic uh, uh, diseases which showed that foodborne allergic uh, diseases are more common in pediatric patients. This was, I think, one study which was done in uh, uh, Amhara region. So uh, severe anaphylaxis has been associated with uh, uh, different factors, like in those patients who have poorly controlled asthma, those with the history of mastocytosis, or uh, who undergo heavy physical ex exertion, or if they are currently taking any medications such as ACE inhibitor, beta blocker, or NSAIDs, they might uh, predispose the patient to having a more severe anaphylactic reaction. And there could be a history of uh, previous anaphylactic reaction, and if there's any delay in epinephrine administration, this can lead to uh, a more severe form of anaphylaxis to occur. So the more rapid an anaphylaxis reaction uh, will occur, uh, then the more likely that uh, it will be severe and potentially fatal. So uh, the parent error route is more likely to lead to an anaphylactic reaction than the oral route when we are uh, talking about medication-associated allergies. Okay, so the common risk factors for developing anaphylaxis in general could be those patients who have genetic predisposition to develop allergic diseases, uh, which we refer to as atopy, or those patients who have allergy, established allergy to nuts, such as peanuts, tree nuts, uh, as well as those who have emotional stress and seasonal occurrence is uh, more likely to occur during the summer and fall uh, seasons due to uh, more outdoor activity during that time, which will expose the patient to more pollen, dander, and whatever might be the uh, source of their, uh, or the trigger for their allergic reaction. Uh, those patients who have higher socioeconomic status and those in the premenstrual age are also at risk for developing anaphylaxis, and as well as those with uh, presence of an uh, acute uh, infection. So the common triggers, uh, basically any agent which can activate a mast cell or a basophil can potentially precipitate an anaphylactic reaction. Uh, but in up to 60% of uh, adults and around 10% of children, the inciting event might not be identified. So in those cases, it might be classified as idiopathic anaphylaxis. But the common triggers which are identified uh, in majority of the patients is uh, usually due to food allergies, insects, things, as well as uh, medications. Uh, so... Uh, Coming in detail, so foods account for, uh, account for around one third of the reported anaphylactic cases and uh, ingestion and inhalation of even the food particles, as well as even, uh, as well as even uh, after skin contact with vomit containing the inst instigating agent, the symptoms typically will start to occur within five to 30 minutes of the ingestion and fatalities are usually reported within 30 minutes of the exposure. So the reactions to mammalian foods uh, might also occur in a delayed fashion as opposed to the other ones. Uh, this is usually due to those patients who might be sensitized to a protein called alpha-gal, uh, which is usually seen in patients uh, who have uh, uh, genetic predisposition to developing an allergy to that specific protein. So the most commonly implicated foods, however, are usually nuts, so peanuts, shellfish like uh, shrimp, and whatever, like tree nuts, uh, other fish, soy, cow's milk, and uh, eggs might also uh, contribute to the, the allergies. So the other common uh, group is usually due to drugs. So from the drugs, the uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, as well as the uh, uh, antibiotics uh, and uh, neuromuscular blocking agents, which are used commonly during uh, anesthesia uh, are some of the common triggers. There's a high incidence also being observed currently to chemotherapeutic agents as well as immune modulators. Uh, so the NSAIDs are the most common triggers from the drug-induced anaphylaxis, and this is believed to occur through the disruption of the arachidonic acid metabolism and through uh, another uh, non-IgE-mediated, uh, non-immunologic-mediated uh, uh, response. So as we know, uh, in most NSAIDs uh, block the COX-1 and COX-2, therefore they will lead to the formation of prostaglandins and this increased amount in the prostaglandins will also uh, contribute to uh, the anaphylaxis. So there's, these reactions typically appear to, uh, to be drug specific. So there is no significant cross-reactivity among the NSAIDs. That means one group of non-steroidals 
having an allergy to one group of non-steroid anti-inflammatories might not necessarily mean that the patient has a, a allergy to the entire uh, NSAID group. So uh, from the antibiotics, uh, penicillins are the most common antibiotics to cause anaphylaxis. Uh, in, but from those labeled to have uh, penicillin al allergies, it's around uh, less than 10% of them will actually uh, have penicillin allergy during uh, skin testing. Uh, so they are often mislabeled as penicillin uh, allergic, uh, and parenteral administration of penicillin is responsible for the majority of the uh, anaphylactic uh, reactions. So the other group is usually due to cephalosporins. So the reason why they might develop uh, allergies to cephalosporins could be uh, the cephalosporins and penicillins share the beta-lactam ring structure in the side chains. Therefore, uh, there might be some allergic cross-reactivity, though it's not that much significant. Uh, it only occurs in up to one to eight percent of these patients, and those patients who experience urticaria or anaphylactic reaction after taking penicillin are more likely to have an adverse reaction. Uh, though there is a rare uh, cross, cross reactivity, which is uh, also being reported in certain drugs uh, like between astrionam and some penams, and in penicillin allergic uh, patients. But this doesn't necessarily mean that uh, these antibiotics should be withheld uh, whenever they are clinically indicated. So it uh, just requires a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, we must consult with our colleagues, uh, if available, with an allergist and an immunologist, uh, or uh, though it's difficult to find those in our country, we might uh, consider uh, also talking to our friends in internal medicine and so on. So the other is uh, insect stings. So for insect stings, around 3% of uh, adults and 1% of uh, children might suffer uh, an insect uh, anaphylaxis from an insect uh, uh, sting, the increased risk of fatal venom anaphylaxis has been associated more in those patients who are in the middle age groups as well as those who have pre-existing cardiovascular disease and upright posture at the time of exposure. So the majority are associated with uh, those in the Hymenopetra species such as wasp, uh, bees, ants and uh, sawflies and some fire ant stings as well can induce anaphylaxis. Uh, they require uh, sensitization exposure uh, previously, but there have been reports where uh, the anaphylactic reaction can occur after the first initial uh, exposure. So another common agent is due to natural uh, rubber or latex. So this usually results from sensitivity to the proteins of the chemicals which are contained in the uh, rubber latex. So uh, delayed type four type of contact Dermatitis or type 1 reaction, immediate uh, hypersensitivity reactions might occur uh, uh, in these uh, exposures. Uh, common agents in which uh, latex might be found could be in those like balloons, pacifiers, condoms, sport equipment, as well as toys. And in healthcare, uh, with endotracheal tubes, blood pressure cuffs, some stethoscope tubings, airway masks, tourniquets, and catheters might be made from latex. Though recently, they, um, uh, especially in the Western world, they've started to uh, eliminate uh, their use. So another common uh, inciting agent could be radio contrast media. So uh, iodine contrast media reactions can be divided into two types. So this is usually the immediate reactions which usually occur within the first hour of administration or the delayed reactions which usually occur between one hour to several days after the administration. So largely these uh, reactions are idiosyncratic and they usually occur within the minutes of the administration of the contrast material. There's uh, delayed reactions are generally more mild to moderate and typically limited to the integumentary system. Uh, and they might manifest as a rash or uh, urticaria and angioedema. But uh, uh, usually the more severe reactions occur immediately within the first hour of uh, administration. There have been certain reports where uh, delayed reactions can rarely escalate to the level of toxic epidermal necrolysis or uh, Stephen Johnson syndrome. Uh, and the exact pathophysiologic mechanism of anaphylactic uh, reactions is unknown, but it is believed to be non-immunologic, uh, that is non-IgE mediated from uh, uh, like IgE titer stun immediately after the reaction. So the common risk factors for uh, anaphylaxis to this contrast material could be for those patients who have previous adverse reactions to iodine contrast material, or if they have history of autopsy or allergic disease, asthma, or if they are concomitantly taking any medications like ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, or proton pump inhibitors. So the risk for severe adverse reaction in iodine contrast media is generally less than 1%. 
but from those patients who are uh, having drug-induced anaphylaxis, up to 27% of the cases were due to iodinated uh, contrast uh, material. So there have been protocols uh, which have been uh, developed, uh, used to pre-test pre and uh, administer uh, certain agents so that we can minimize the risk of serious allergic reactions in those patients in whom we know that they have had a previous adverse reaction to uh, iodine contrast materials. So we might consider administering prednisolone 50 milligrams PO uh, given around 13 hours, seven hours, and one hours prior to the procedure or diphenhydramine uh, with an uh, H1 blocker like diphenhydramine, 50 milligram PO given one hour prior to the procedure. And we might consider also adding an H2 antagonist like famotidine or uh, ephedrine one hour before the procedure. Uh, though uh, the, there's currently little evidence to support that the use of these agents might prevent anaphylaxis in those patients who receive uh, specifically uh, isosmolar radio contrast material, uh, especially for emergently needed uh, tests. Uh, and it's generally not recommended to delay any necessary testing for emergency department patients who require emergent imaging with radio contrast material to administer these medications as a prophylactic measure. So these adverse reactions to uh, radio contrast material are not related to iodine, and therefore these patients should never be labeled as having iodine allergy. Uh, and another agent that we may use for imaging could be gadolinium, especially in those patients who receive the MRIs. So uh, it's generally not, uh, sorry, uh, gadolinium has usually no cross-reactivity in uh, allergy to iodinated contrast material, uh, and it generally has a lower uh, uh, incidence rates as low as 0.04% to 0.01%. And uh, usually uh, after exposure to this agent, the reaction will occur within minutes. And those patients, uh, again, similar to those uh, who are allergic to iodine contrast material, those who are asthmatic, those with food allergies, uh, allergic to medication, as well as females are more prone to develop uh, anaphylactic reaction to gadolinium. So <coughs> Sorry. So the other one is exercise-induced anaphylaxis. So exercise-induced anaphylaxis uh, is a clinical syndrome in which anaphylactic-like reaction might occur uh, in association with some physical exercises. Though it's uh, more commonly seen in uh, those patients who undergo moderate to intense physical activity, it has been seen in those patients who are uh, doing even less strenuous activities like walking or like sweeping and uh, these reactions are inconsistent with physical activity, so it's very difficult to diagnose, uh, especially the exercise-induced uh, anaphylaxis. So another subtype uh, could be the food-dependent exercise-induced anaphylaxis. Uh, typically, uh, there's a triggering food which is also ingested four to six hours prior to uh, the onset of this uh, reaction, as well as uh, maybe an NSAID which was uh, administered around 24 hours, within the 24 hours prior to the physical uh, activity and they might precipitate the reaction. So the most common uh, triggering food identified is uh, usually uh, wheat. So uh, in those patients who are prone to a food dependent exercise induced anaphylaxis, uh, there needs to be guidance to avoid taking those types of uh, foods or avoiding certain medications prior to engaging in, in uh, any exercises. Uh, whenever the reaction actually does occur, we should instruct the patients to discontinue the exercise at the first sign of the symptoms. And uh, we need to prescribe uh, epinephrine auto-injectors for these patients for whenever they might develop uh, this reaction. We need to also counsel to avoid exercising alone and preferably only exercise with uh, uh, someone who is also aware of their medical condition and is, uh, knows how to administer the epinephrine uh, if uh, it's deemed necessary. So the other is idiopathic anaphylaxis, as I mentioned earlier, around uh, 30 to 60% of the adults, as well as 10% of children, have no identifiable trigger. So the diagnosis made after evaluation and testing, uh, however, in uh, I think around 30% of uh, patients later on uh, who had follow up with allergies, there was uh, a trigger which was identified. So uh, we'll come to it later, but it's very important to have a proper follow up with the uh, allergist in these particular patients. So uh, those uh, patients who have idiopathic anaphylaxis, uh, it might be required to start them on daily prophylactic medications like antihistamines or steroids, uh, or certain immune modulators like omalizumab. 
Okay, so coming to the clinical features, so the reactions vary in duration and the severity, but they typically are rapid in onset. The most uh, of the reactions will occur after exposure within the two hours, and the presentation will uh, vary depending on different factors like the degree of hypersensitivity of the patient, the quantity of the allergen they are exposed to, the rate of exposure, uh, like the rate of the antigen exposure, as well as the sensitivity and responsiveness of the target organs. Um, predominantly, majority of the clinical manifestations are skin related in 80 to 90% of the patients. They usually have pruritus, urticaria, eruptions, flushing, tingling, and uh, sensation of warmth. Uh, and uh, respiratory symptoms are the second most common, accounting for around 70 to 80% of the sy symptoms. Uh, and they might have uh, coughing, chest tightness, strider, wheezing. Uh, they might have a subjective sense of dyspnea or throat tightness. Uh, and uh, GI uh, manifestations can occur in 25 to 30% of patients, including nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, crampy abdominal pain, as well as tenismus. Uh, cardiovascular uh, uh, manifestations also might occur, like hypotension, dysrhythmia, maybe minor manifested as lightheadedness light or syncope, though it is very unlikely to find, uh, especially in uh, infants and children, it's very unlikely to uh, have uh, the, the uh, to have hypotension or shock as uh, the only sole uh, manifesting feature initially. So they might also have seen this uh, manifestations like altered mentation due to the shock state uh, or seizures due to hypoxia if the patient has uh, had uh, airway obstruction leading to hypoxia. So anaphylactic reactions, again, vary a great deal from one individual to another, and they might even vary among different uh, episodes in the same individual. Uh, so for this, uh, uh, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, as well as the Food Allergy and Anaphylaxis Network, as well as World uh, Allergy Organizations, have adopted specific diagnostic guidelines. So these diagnostic guidelines have uh, uh, helped us to uh, identify those patients who are highly likely to have uh, anaphylactic reaction. So generally, in the first diagnostic criteria, Usually, it's uh, due to sudden onset of an illness with involvement of the skin or the mucosal membrane, or both, and at least involving one other system. You know, this could be the respiratory system, as manifested as shortness of breath, wheezing, cough, strider, or hypoxia, or it could be the cardiovascular system, such as hypotension uh, and associated symptoms of end organ uh, dysfunction, like hypotonia, syncope, or uh, incontinence. So uh, the second one could be if they manifest at least two or more of the um, um, systems involving after they have been exposed to an allergen, if it involves either this integumentary system with the same uh, features as I mentioned earlier, the respiratory system, the cardiovascular system, or the gastrointestinal system. That is if they have crampy abdominal pain, vomiting. So if any two of these systems are affected, you need to consider uh, anaphylaxis. And the third one is usually if a patient presents solely with reduced blood pressure after an exposure to a non-allergen uh, within minutes to several hours, especially in infants, low systolic blood pressure, there is a specific uh, cutoff. So usually for those between one month and one year, uh, it's a systolic less than 70. But uh, for those who are between the ages of one year to 10 years old, it's usually 70 plus two times the age of the patient. So that's usually the systolic uh, blood pressure threshold in which we identify hypotension. For those above 11, uh, just like adults, we'll use a cutoff of less than 90 millimeter of mercury. And uh, another is if the patient's blood pressure drops by more than 30% from their baseline, uh, the, this could also uh, be a manifestation of uh, anaphylactic shock. So uh, we need to use this as a diagnostic uh, criteria. Okay. So the other is the differentials. So we have uh, different differentials for these uh, manifestations. So uh, it could be due to just like you generalized urticaria, uh, asthma exacerbation can mimic uh, uh, an allergic reaction. So can a pulmonary embolism or myocardial infarct uh, or any other adverse cutaneous drug reactions, panic attacks, uh, food associated flushing, uh, certain foods can cause flushing, uh, alcohol intake, uh, uh, and other medications like sulfites, uh, the consumption of scombroid uh, doses, carcinoid tumor, perimenopausal women as well who are undergoing hot flashes, 
and uh, pyrotoxicosis can mimic this. And other shock states like septic hypovolemic cardiogenic or distributive shock can also can manifest as anaphylactic reactions. And uh, uh, hypoglycemia, ACE inhibitor, and associated angioedema. Uh, Redman syndrome, which is commonly seen after uh, rapid administration of vancomycin and other neurologic disorders. And so the list is uh, actually extensive. Um, we need to consider uh, uh, anaphylaxis as the first cause. And once we have ruled out anaphylaxis, then we can consider other diagnosis. That's the main thing. So regarding the diagnostic testing, anaphylaxis is primarily a clinical diagnosis. So any elevated serum histamine levels require uh, acquired within uh, one hour and triptase levels, uh, specifically for those who have been exposed to hymenopetra venum. Uh, within three hours of the onset of symptoms have been shown to correlate with anaphylaxis. However, their routine use in the emergency department is uh, not feasible. It will take hours for the drugs uh, to come and as well as the initial results being normal doesn't necessarily exclude anaphylaxis as it could be due to a non-IgE uh, mediated type of reaction. So they are rarely helpful in the acute setting. So triptase levels may not be elevated even in food-induced anaphylaxis due to delayed uh, type of reaction in these patients. Um, so the diagnostic studies should be aimed at excluding uh, other emergency conditions that could potentially be confused with anaphylaxis. So coming to the management, uh, so the most important thing on uh, management is the most the prompt recognition and uh, initiation of the appropriate measures is the key uh, uh, intervention that we can perform. So any treatment delay uh, could potentially lead to further hypoxia, circulatory collapse, and even death. So we need to have uh, um, a very uh, high index of suspicion and we need to act very rapidly uh, in these patients. So as usual, in any patient in an emergency, we need to uh, approach them through the airway breathing circulation uh, method. So we need to assess their airway, uh, their breathing, the their circulation. And uh, concomitantly, we need to administer as soon as possible epinephrine immediately should be administered, uh, usually in the distal to mid to distal lateral thigh, once anaphylaxis has been identified. And we need to also have a quick uh, effort to remove any triggering agents. So if it's medications, you need to discontinue the medication. If it's uh, any stinger which is still in place, you need to remove the stingers. Uh, uh, however, uh, for example, for foodborne uh, uh, anaphylaxis, it's not recommended to perform gastric lavage or anything to uh, try to decrease the uh, exposure uh, due to the higher risk of aspiration in these patients. So uh, along with this, the initial intervention should include continuous cardiac pulse oximetry monitoring, as well as having uh, at least double IV line and uh, providing supplemental uh, oxygen. So on the airway, uh, some of the interventions will have supplemental oxygen. Generally, we should put the patients on a face mask with a non rebreather, uh, and then we can titrate the amount of oxygen we are administering based on their uh, uh, saturation levels. Then we need to also prepare for possible advanced airway management, especially in those patients who have uh, oral and mucosal involvement. Uh, uh, we need to pre prepare for difficult airway because there will be rapid uh, closure of the airway and distortion of the anatomy. So it, we need to be prepared for a difficult airway. So uh, the ideal uh, method of uh, managing the airway in these patients is performing a wake intubation with fiber optical laryngoscopy, but we need to have a surgical airway backup. And uh, we also need to have at least an uh, interdisciplinary approach here where we have the most senior emergency physicians, the most uh, experienced anesthesiologists, as well as uh, ENT specialists around so that uh, we can uh, manage the patient. So patients with uh, bronchospasm, uh, might benefit from bronchodilators, uh, but it does not preclude the use of epinephrine. So generally, we'll, after a, the administration of the epinephrine in itself can help us to uh, mitigate uh, the uh, or to treat the bronchospasm. But in those patients who are still not responding, we might consider bronchodilators like short-acting beta agonists like albuterol or salbutamol or uh, anticholinergic like the ipratropia. So albuterol should be ideally nebulized uh, in adults or pediatric patients. Around 2.5 milligrams should be diluted in 3 ml of uh, normal saline or distilled water and uh, should be nebulized. Hypertropium as well uh, needs to be nebulized at a dose of 0.5 milligram for adults as, or 0.25 milligram uh, for 
pediatric patients. So as I've mentioned earlier, the mainstay of management in these uh, patients is epinephrine. So epinephrine should be given immediately whenever anaphylaxis is suspected. And uh, there's a strong correlation between early epinephrine administration and decreased hospitalization or fatality. It was shown that uh, in up to 30% of patients receive epinephrine in the pre-hospital setting, and only 50 to 70% of those ultimately diagnosed with anaphylaxis receive epinephrine in the emergency department. This is due to there's an over-reliance in using uh, the second line and third line treatments like antihistamines or corticosteroids in the initial management. There is no role in the immediate management of anaphylaxis. We need to focus on early and timely administration of epinephrine. The longer we wait, the more severe the risk of the anaphylaxis reaction, and the more likely we are predisposing the patient to have a fatal anaphylactic reaction. So how much epinephrine do we administer? We need to administer around 0.3 to 0.5 milligram of the one milligram per ml formulation intramuscularly, as I mentioned, through the vastus lateralis muscle on the distal lateral thigh. Uh, and for pediatric patients, we can administer around 0.01 milligram per kg or uh, 0.01 ml per kg of the one in 1000 concentration. And we can repeat it uh, every five to 10 minutes, the, up to three doses. Uh, and it's been shown that around 30% of these patients might require more than one dose to treat the acute uh, exacerbation, uh, sorry, the acute uh, anaphylactic reaction. So optimally, I am uh, dosing is the one which is recommended. The uh, reason why intravenous epinephrine is not recommended is because there's an increased risk of cardiac dysrhythmia. Uh, uh, thus, it requires cautious cardiac and hemodynamic monitoring even when it is administered. Though, again, the first line route of administration is intramuscular. Plus, uh, it will also um, uh, it will uh, it will also it's also easier to administer intramuscular injection rather than trying to uh, find uh, intravenous access. So it will help to prevent the delays in trying to access vascular access as well. So for those patients who remain hypotensive after multiple doses, uh, around two to three doses is usually what it takes, but you, if they usually don't respond after three doses, uh, uh, and after adequate volume expansion using uh, crystalloids, we need to consider intravenous infusion of uh, epinephrine. So infusion rates will generally be at one uh, microgram per minute, and we will titrate it to hemodynamic uh, stability uh, with a maximum dose of around 10 microgram per minute. However, in pediatric uh, patients, we will infuse it at around 0.1 microgram per kg per minute uh, uh, basis, and we will try to mark uh, titrated to hemodynamic stability up to a maximum of 1.5 microgram per kg per minute. So regarding uh, the other issue is positioning in these patients. So uh, those patients who are hypotensive should be placed in the supine position with their lower extremities elevated. This will help to at least uh, improve the certain venous return. Uh, and uh, if However, this should not be done if the patient is exp experiencing severe airway difficulty or is vomiting. In those uh, cases, we need to put them in recumbent left lateral recumbent position. Uh, and specifically in those pregnant women who might be suffering from an anaphylactic reaction, we should place them in the left lateral decubitus position uh, with the uterus displaced uh, towards the left so that uh, we will uh, 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 decrease the risk of uh, inferior vena cava compression and improve uh, venous return. So for volume expansion, uh, as I've mentioned, we need to have at least two large bore IV lines, uh, ideally 14 to 16 gauge. Uh, we need to pump around one to two liters of normal saline as rapidly as possible. Uh, and uh, yeah, a large amount of fluid might be required up to seven liters uh, in adults and up to 100 ml per kg might be required in pediatric patients. The reason is there will be extra vasation. Uh, it's been shown that almost 35% of the fluid will um, extravasate into the, intra, in, into the interstitial uh, space within the first few minutes of an anaphylactic reaction. So uh, aggressive rapid volume expansion uh, is uh, required. So the second line and third line treatments uh, include the use of antihistamines and corticosteroids. So antihistamines, usually H1 and H2 blockers, should never be used as a sole or initial treatment in anaphylaxis, as I've mentioned earlier. They usually help in relieving the cutaneous symptoms, uh, but they do not do anything to address the um, 
pulmonary uh, issues as well as the hypotension. Uh, that's why epinephrine is still the first line. So the reason why epinephrine is still the first line is well, when you look at even the underlying uh, uh, physiology which occurs in anaphylaxis, the alpha-1 effect of the epinephrine will help us to have peripheral vasoconstriction, which will help to improve the systemic vascular re uh, resistance. And uh, the beta-1 effect will increase the chronotropy and ionotropy, therefore improving the cardiac output. And for uh, the beta-2 effect as well, it will actually have uh, an effect of uh, stabilizing the mast cells in basophils so that it will prevent further degranulation. Uh, so that's why epinephrine is the first line. However, diphenhydramine here only has an effect on the cutaneous cutaneous effect by stabilizing the uh, histamine, uh, the release from the mast cells and other uh, inflammatory mediator cells. However, um, when it is used, uh, diphenhydramine should be administered intravenously around 50 milligrams IV or one milligram per kg in pediatric patients. And uh, H2 uh, blockers like ranitidine or sinitidine might uh, be considered as well. So the other is glucocorticoids. Uh, again, there's no immediate effect on the management of anaphylaxis. It's considered a second or third line intervention and uh, onset of action typically takes several hours. Uh, the role of glucocorticoids has been postulated to be to prevent protracted symptoms uh, or the occurrence of a biphasic reaction or a delayed type of uh, uh, re-anaphylaxis uh, reaction, but there's no strong evidence to support their use for those purposes either. So uh, whenever it is used, however, we need to use uh, ideally hydrocortisone. Uh, that uh, can be given around 250 to 500 milligrams intravenously, followed by uh, 5 to 10 milligrams in pediatric pay, uh, milligrams per kg intravenously to a maximum of 500 milligrams in uh, pediatric uh, patients. Uh, other steroids which may be used could be either methylprednisolone or uh, prednisolone. Uh, yeah, however, methylprednisolone and uh, hydrocortisone are equally effective, and uh, the mineral corticoid effect of corticosteroids uh, usually, like hydrocortisone and cortisone, have the strongest effect, uh, followed by prednisone. So, methylprednisolone and dexamethasone have the lowest mineral corticoid effect. So, we need to consider the, those agents with a higher mineral corticoid uh, effect uh, in the elderly patients or in those patients in whom fluid retention. Uh, would be uh, considered a problem problematic. So the other is uh, for those patients who are receiving beta blockade. So those patients who are receiving beta blockade, uh, then there's uh, they're less likely to respond to uh, the epinephrine. So in that case, we might consider administering glucagon. Uh, it has both ionotropic and chronotropic effect, uh, and it's this effect is usually independent of the alpha or beta receptor mediated uh, effect that we usually expect in the heart. So uh, we can administer it at uh, one to five milligram IV uh, dose for adults or 20 to 30 microgram per kg for children. Then we might follow it up by an uh, infusion. Uh, okay, so the uh, last topic will be regarding the disposition of these patients. So uh, regarding their disposition, around 20% of uh, these patients uh, with anaphylaxis might experience a biphasic uh, reaction. Uh, most of this reaction usually occurs within eight hours, but it has been uh, reported as late as 72 hours. Uh, so when we say uh, biphasic reaction, it's defined as a recurrence of anaphylactic symptoms without re-exposure to the triggering agent. Uh, so uh, again, as I've mentioned, like corticosteroids are usually uh, administered to prevent this biphasic reaction, but uh, again, recent studies have uh, shown that there is no significant effect uh, uh, in that regard. So the increased risk of biphasic reaction is usually observed in those patients who present initially with hypotension or wide pulse pressure or who are exposed to an unknown trigger. And uh, those patients who require more than a single dose of intramuscular epinephrine or those who have cutaneous signs and symptoms uh, history of prior anaphylaxis or delayed epinephrine administration have an increased risk of having a biphasic uh, uh, attack, uh, biphasic, uh, biphasic type of uh, reaction. So the other is uh, considering discharge. Uh, so to consider discharge in these patients, recent literature suggests that uh, an observation period of one hour can be uh, instituted with a negative predictive value of up to 95% for the recurrence of uh, the anaphylaxis. 
and the six-hour observation period showed a 97.3% negative predictive value for uh, recurrence. So uh, in a period of four to six hours, in, in within this period, one to six hour observation period, uh, certain uh, guidelines say four to six hours period, you can consider uh, uh, discharging these patients provided that they don't have risk factors for a biphasic reaction or that they don't have uh, severity signs initially. Uh, if the patient had any life-threatening uh, conditions, like for example, if the patient was having hypotension at initial presentation, or if they was having uh, airway involvement or uh, respiratory involvement, uh, it's more recommended to admit these patients and observe them uh, for a more prolonged period of time. So uh, uh, again, as I've mentioned, those who are hypotensive airway involvement, Lala Chow, those with uh, protracted anaphylaxis, and those who receive more than two doses of epinephrine, poor outpatient social support. And for those who can't uh, access an epinephrine auto-injector device, we need to consider uh, admitting them uh, to a monitored setup, or ideally the ICU. So prior to the discharge of uh, the patients uh, who are not having a life-threatening attack, the clinicians should take an active role in educating the patients or the caretakers about uh, what their allergy is uh, and what anaphylaxis is. We need to demonstrate and uh, show them how to administer auto-injectors. And uh, patients should be encouraged to develop uh, an individualized anaphylaxis emergency action plan. And we need to consider acquiring uh, medical identification devices like bracelets or a card in their wallet which they could keep so that uh, um, any uh, uh, like uh, Samaritan who is trying to help them can uh, uh, identify what the cause could be or any healthcare professional who's trying to help can identify uh, what this patient might be allergic to. So the other important thing is identifying what the inciting uh, agent is or what the allergen is if possible. So it might not be feasible necessarily in the emergency department. You need to have uh, at least ruled out some of the major uh, common causes that we have discussed. And you need to, uh, whenever possible, try to uh, refer them to an allergist or immunologist earlier so that they can undergo further testing, skin testing for different agents and so on to identify what specifically was the trigger. Uh, if the trigger is known, you need to instruct them on how to avoid the future exposure to that uh, trigger. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, that was, uh, that's all I have. Okay, thank you very much, doctor. I think we have uh, a few questions in the Q&A section, so we can move to that. Okay, uh, all right. So from the Q&A, uh, the first question, uh, Betalhem asks how to treat recurrent angioedema. So uh, for those patients who have uh, recurrent angioedema, again, uh, corticosteroids might be used. Uh, in the acute exacerbation, we will continue managing them with uh, either the epinephrine, the antihistamines, and the steroids, but long-term steroids might be required in these patients. And if the patient has, uh, for example, uh, the cause of the angioedema is also uh, important, we need to identify if it's either hereditary or is it medication-induced. If it's medication-induced, we need to also discontinue the medication, like if they were taking ACE inhibitors or so on. We need to uh, hold that and advise the patient to avoid those and change the agent uh, for the underlying cause that they have been taking those medications. So the second one is uh, in a setting where no medication is available, what measure may we take? So in a setting where no medication is available, uh, so uh, if let's say this happened on the street, so the first thing you need to avoid is the positioning. Usually those patients who are having severe anaphylaxis, uh, you shouldn't position them to sit up. Uh, sitting, causing them to sit up uh, can cause something called uh, anti-ventricle syndrome and it can induce sudden cardiac deaths. So for that reason, you need to keep them flat or supine and you need to elevate their legs and as much as possible. Uh, if the offending agent is uh, identified, for example, let's say if it was a stinger from an insect, you need to remove it. Uh, and you need to, as soon as possible, the main thing is you need to also activate the inmates or try to ask for help so that you can have epinephrine uh, from a nearby pharmacy or uh, whatever. If it's in hospital setting, however, most common cause in in hospital settings, as I mentioned earlier, is usually due to drug reactions. 
So if it's a, caused by a drug reaction, you need to discontinue that drug immediately and you need to administer epinephrine. Now, epinephrine is usually available in hospitals. So uh, I don't think we'll have much of, a, much of a problem with that. So the other is uh, Dr. Kudrazak asks, can we use promethazine PO in anaphylaxis as a first line antihistamine? So again, as I've mentioned, antihistamines are not first line. They're just second or third lines, and they will only help in treating the skin manifestations. So it will just help to improve the uh, urticaria or the pruritus. Uh, other than that, uh, there's no role in using antihistamines as a first line in anything. Okay, so... Uh, Abu Amara said, is it glucocorticoid query instead of mineral corticoid? To my knowledge, aldosterone is mineral corticoid, but not hydrocortisone or methylprednisolone. Yeah, so the point was uh, in specific patients, uh, we might consider adding steroids, which have both glucocorticoid and mineral corticoid effects. But uh, what you are administering specifically for anaphylaxis is glucocorticoid, glucocorticoids. Okay, so the other is why vast uh, lateralis site is preferred for adrenaline than others like gluteus maximus or medialis. Okay, uh, so the reason why we prefer vastus lateralis is it's uh, one, uh, easily accessible. Two, uh, uh, the other issue is uh, there's a more predictable uh, um, means of uh, achieving peak plasma levels with, while using the, that route. Uh, what I found was uh, it specifically says that when you use the vastus lateralis, uh, the peak plasma levels can be reached within eight minutes. Uh, so that's why they prefer using the vastus lateralis. And uh, since it's a large muscle group with uh, more uh, blood supply, it will have a more rapid type of uh, like diffusion of the drug into the bloodstream. So I think that's the reason why they preferred using a larger muscle group. So uh, I think Dr. Gitacho asked, uh, ACE inhibitor induced anaphylaxis management. So if it's caused by ACE inhibitor, again, so the offending agent should be discontinued. And uh, regardless of the cause, again, we will use the same thing. We will administer anaphylaxis, uh, we will administer epinephrine as the first line agent. You will discontinue the uh, medication which incited it, in this case, which is the ACE inhibitor then you can consider also adding the antihistamines or the steroids. Okay, the other is uh, Dr. Asafa. Uh, he asked how we manage if a patient not known he takes food. Yeah, so I think that's a common issue. Uh, usually uh, there could be cross-contamination of certain foods. Uh, but in that case, again, as I've mentioned earlier, anaphylaxis is a clinical diagnosis, provided that uh, you have found uh, the, the patient fulfills the criteria to diagnose anaphylaxis, you need to continue with the management, and then you can search for the what possible cause could have been, uh, what other food could have been the trigger uh, by asking the patient uh, what, media, what food he was taking previously, how it was prepared, was there any cross-contamination, and so on. Uh, but again, the management uh, comes first here because it's life-threatening. So the Rubabel Musi asked, uh, can someone who is taking phenobarbital develop anaphylaxis after one month? Yeah, so uh, anaphylaxis can occur due to even uh, any previously exposed lone natrum uh, nagarot. We can develop anaphylaxis. So... Usually, it might not be IgE mediated. It could be other non-immunologically on each lug. Uh, but specifically for phenobarbital, I haven't come across anything specifically which uh, regarding uh, phenobarb uh, anaphylaxis. So, Dr. Binyam you asks, is PO medication is PO medication one the second line effective if the drug is not available in IV form and use of NG tube for administration? Uh, yeah, so as we've said, like the first line is still a P for second line. If you're trying to administer the antihistamine or the steroids, you can consider administering PO if you don't have intravenous uh, formulations of those drugs. 
Okay, Dr. Kefli asks, uh, in our case, penicillin allergy common in our setup, what immediate action should be taken other than epinephrine? So usually penicillin, uh, the parenteral uh, administration is the method uh, through which they usually develop anaphylaxis. So discontinue the drug, continue giving epinephrine. The management is basically the same for any form of anaphylaxis. So uh, I don't think there's a specific caveat for uh, the penicillin allergy. You still need to discontinue the medication he's taking. You still need to administer the epinephrine. And uh, you need to make sure that the patient is aware of that penicillin, uh, possible penicillin allergy, and uh, needs to avoid taking those medications in the future once it's been confirmed. Good. Uh, yes, Dr. Gitacho has raised an excellent point. It's also good to mention the drug or the allergens in medical records or medical cards. Yes, that's very important. Uh, and it's also important to uh, provide for the patient uh, a card listing what drugs he's uh, uh, like allergic to so that uh, even if he's not necessarily uh, visiting your health facility, uh, any facility he does visit is aware of those uh, risks. Okay, uh, Dr. Jonas asked, uh, how do you approach if patient was taking multiple medications like insulin, beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, aspirin, and ciprofloxacin? So uh, again, so the most life-threatening thing needs to be treated first. So in anaphylaxis, as I've mentioned, the most important things that we need to avoid is we need to treat any hypoxia. We need to avoid airway compromise. We need to fix the hypotension. So it, the emergency management is a common trend, regardless of what the allergen or the trigger was. So once you have addressed that, then you can consider the others. But uh, the good point here is uh, if the patient was also taking beta blockers, as I mentioned earlier, it might be more difficult to manage him with epinephrine. So for that reason, uh, though it's not available in our uh, region, we can consider giving uh, glucagon, the other issue is if it's still uh, refractory to that, you can consider adding other vasopressors with different mechanism of action. If he's still persistently hypotensive, even with uh, epinephrine. So uh, usually vasopressin, if available, is good. If not, you can consider also administering noradrenaline or uh, uh, dopamine. So those could be other agents that we can use. I think that's... Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. We have addressed all the questions raised. So, on behalf of players, so if you have any other last remark that you want to address, let me give you the stage one more time. Okay, uh, uh, first I wanna thank you guys, uh, Blue Health for uh, facilitating this type of medium. Uh, I think there's a lot that we can all learn from each other and uh, I found uh, your uh, seminars to be very informative uh, and I want to encourage you guys to keep up the good work. And I wanna thank uh, all the people uh, who were attending today. Uh, hopefully uh, uh, we have a common understanding on how to manage uh, this uh, emergency. Thank you. Thank you.